Gentlemen, Namaskar and welcome to another session of the 16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by that all, Banega Swast India. We are delighted to introduce our next session titled Independence, and it's presented by Inox Multiplex. Celebrated writer and academic Chitra Banerjee Divakarune's novel, Independence, is a moving tale of three sisters and their individual yet intertwined experiences of the partition of 1947. Moving fluidly across the roots of love, loss, family, and legacy, Divakaruni presents us with a heart-wrenching family saga in the backdrop of national upheaval. She will be in conversation today with Archal Malhotra. Our speaker today, Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni, is an award-winning writer, activist, teacher, and the author of 21 books, including Mistress of Spices, The Forest of Enchantments, and recently, The Last Queen, which won her the Times of India Ought Her Award for Best Fiction, Fiki 22, 2022 Award for Best Fiction, and the Best Book of 2022 Award. Her, new, her latest novel is titled Independence. Ma'am, may we please have you up on stage? And a loud round of applause for her, please. Our moderator today is Archal Malhotra, a writer and oral historian from New Delhi. Her critically acclaimed books, Remnants of a Separation, and In the Language of Remembering, explore the human history of generational impact of the partition of 1947. Her newest work is a novel titled The Book of Everlasting Things. And since it's a book launch, we also have a special guest to help us launch the book today. She's also known these days as the mother-in-law to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. May we please have Ms. Sadha Murthy up on stage to launch the book. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't have really any work here other than receiving Chitra's book, Independence. And it's a great joy. Number one, this is a very good book. Second, Chitra is a good friend of mine since 35 years. So it's always a joy to meet your friend who is so creative, so well-known, and very, very good friend. Chitra, I have a small suggestion. In partition, Bengal was divided into two parts, and today's Bangladesh people immigrated to Calcutta, and that's your book on this. And uh, Ms. Malhotra, there is, you have written on partition from Punjab, West Punjab, and East Punjab, or Pakistan to India. Now, may I request Chitra, you should write one more book that Sindhis from Karachi immigrated, <laughs> immigrated to India, whereas Punjabis from Pakistan, they still they have a land. Bengalis uh, from Bangla Bengalis in Calcutta still they came from Bangladesh, but Karachi Sindh people from Karachi lost their land forever, and that's really much more difficult than losing your entire identity of the land at Karachi, where they were 49 percent. So may I request the creative mind of Chitra Banerjee to create the agony, the adventure, the hardworking Sindhi people, how they made it. And that will be your next book. And let's meet again in Jaipur Festival to release that book. Thank you. Dhanyawad. Enjoy the session. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's full house. Thank you for being with us this morning. I'm not going to waste any time introducing the novel. In fact, we're going to get straight into conversation. 
Chitra, you've written several novels on the contemporary time period, particularly the diaspora experience, but of late, you've been moving back into history with your subject matter, mythological fiction, historical fiction, and now partition and independence. Can you tell us why you chose this subject matter and chose to situate your plot during this time period? Yes. Uh, Anshil, that's a great question. I'll get to it in just one moment. I just want to thank the Jaipur Lit Fest organizers and the wonderful Teamwork Arts people for putting on this great festival for all of us. Let's give them a hand. They work so hard at this. I'm delighted to be invited back to Jaipur and uh, just delighted to be in the company of people after all the, the long COVID years where we only could do things online. The energy here is so great. And I know you have so many choices today, like right now, and I'm delighted you've chosen the best one. <laughs> I also have to show up for you for one minute, my sari. It is a it is a Kantha Shari from Bengal, and it's important because the Kantha art of Bengal has a big part to play. It was a great uh, way for women to be independent, especially in difficult times, like when the partition was going on. So I just wanted to commend them by wearing this Sari. I respect them. Why write on the subject of partition and independence? Yes, that's a great question. It really started, uh, I started thinking about it, I should say I started thinking about it consciously after I wrote my previous novel, the historical novel, The Last Queen about Maharani Jinda Kaur, wife of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And she was a wonderful woman. She was so brave. She was so feisty. She was just amazing and forgotten by history, erased by history. Uh, so I, it was a delight to write about her. But her story ends when the British are in full power. And it's very sad. It's a very sad moment in Indian history that in spite of everything she does, they take over Punjab, they take the Kohinoor, they take her son, they take all of that to England. And I did not want to leave that story there. It was very important for me to trace it to the end of that movement when the British have to themselves leave India and we gain our independence. For me, that was really important. So that was one thing. The second thing was when I was growing up, my grandfather and my mother, who both lived through independence, as I'm sure many of your parents and grandparents did, and they told me these stories. And all the time when I was growing up, perhaps like some of you, I didn't pay much attention. I didn't really respect those stories. I'd be like, yes, yes, you told me this before. But it was only later I realized how important those stories were about the birth of our nation and how important it was to remember the experiences of what people went through to make this country free. So I wanted to you know, honor those stories by putting them in fictional form in this book. So I think those are like two important things. And the third one is those people, many of them have passed away. And if we don't remember the story of how we became a nation, how we became free, that is a very sad thing. And we will forget if we don't read about it. On that note, can you tell us a little bit about the book without spoilers, but also this concept of national dream versus personal dream of independence? Yeah, so the book has two levels. One is the national level, what is going on in the country, what's going on with the major political figures. And there too, I have chosen to focus on some of the women freedom fighters because their story is pushed to the back as well. Many who were very brave, who died fighting. They, you know, they, were, they died carrying the flag. We've forgotten them. But also, I wanted to bring in the story of three sisters in a family and their mother and what happens to them. And what are some of the dreams that they've had before this moment of independence hits them in 1946 with the direct action day riots which changed their lives? And what are their dreams afterwards? And how is independence 
the in individual independence that we want, how is that related to that national desire for independence? And can we as a nation really be independent if the women of the nation are not allowed independence? So. There's a small section at the beginning of your book about uh, one of the sisters, Priya, uh, assisting her father. Can you read? Can you read from it? Sure. So this is early in the book. Priya is the youngest of the three sisters. Her father, Nobu Kumar, who is kind of uh, based a little bit on my own grandfather, is a village doctor. And this is on a night when late in the night, someone knocks on their door, they open the door, and it's a poor man, and he says, please come to my house, I'm having uh, an emergency. And Nobu Kumar, who's very kind, who treats uh, poor people without caring if they can give him the, his fees, says yes. And Priya says, can I accompany you? And he says yes. They walk through the sultry night to the Fisher neighborhood. Narrow paths, shacks leaning drunkenly against each other. The man, his name is Hamid, leads them into the smallest one. Dim light from a smoky lamp, a pregnant woman panting on a mat. The frightened midwife tells them the baby's heartbeat is very faint. The umbilical cord might be tangled, Nabukumar says. He disinfects his hands, examines the patient. I'll have to cut her open. Chloroform. Priya pushes away fear and follows instructions. Press the chloroform rag against the patient's face until she slackens. Clean the belly with antiseptics. Tell Hamid and the midwife to hold the lantern steady. Hand Nabukumar the instruments he calls for. Scalpel, scissors, clamp. Do not flinch when blood wells dark from the incision in the woman's belly. The woman moans, calm, calm. More chloroform, count out the drops with a steady hand, hold the weeping flesh apart. Nabukumar lifts out a baby boy. Cut the cord, serpent coiled around the infant's neck. Hold him by his feet, slap his back, hand him to the midwife when he cries. No time for complacency here. Help to stitch up the woman, clean the blood, tear strips from the, her mother's saris. Bandage the wound, administer penicillin injection. Tell the overwhelmed Hamid what he must do until the doctor's next visit. The fisherman's eyes well up. He accompanies them back in silence. And at their door, he weeps again, trying to gather words for his gratitude trying to hand Nabukumar a handful of coins. Nabukumar waves them away, but he does not make Hamid feel small. Bring us some fish when the catch is good, he says. Hamid nods. He walks away, shoulders straighter, head high. Priya thinks, how much I have to learn from Baba about doctoring, about human decency. At the threshold of the sleeping house, she gathers courage. When I took the baby from your hands, knowing that it might have died, but for us, I've never experienced anything as exhilarating. Did I do well? You did wonderfully. Calm and efficient. You were the perfect assistant. She's lightheaded with tiredness, terrified with hope. Will you let me attend the medical college in Calcutta then? I want to be a doctor. It is my dream. Nabukumar looks away. I'm too tired to discuss this right now. This is not the whole truth. He forestalls her each time she tries to bring up the subject. But she is his daughter, inheritress of his stubborn genes. She will not give up. So that is her dream, her dream for independence. Thank you. Thank you so much. And on that subject, I want to talk about women protagonists. 
almost every single book of yours is woman-centric. And I read somewhere in an interview where you said you want to make your heroines human. But when I was reading Independence and the story of these Ranipur siblings, Deepa, Jamni, Priya, their mother, Bina, and the circumstances that they go through starting with direct action day, following through to the months after independence and the creation of India and Pakistan, I really thought that the unique situations each of them find themselves in spoke to the many ways in which women were impacted by partition. And that's quite different from the way men or the way in which we remember collective history was impacted. So perhaps could you talk about the scenarios that you wrote them into and what they spoke about you know, the women's role during partition. You are so right, Anshul, because women did experience partition differently. And uh, their particular challenges, the violence they faced often on their bodies. You know, it, it's something we need to remember. It's often not seen, or if it's seen, it's seen through the male gaze. So it was very important for me as a woman to write the stories of these women who were undergoing independence, partition, violence, but also exhilaration and uh, you know the coming forth of dreams after a long time. So both the positive and the negative, I had to put them in the center. It's as you've said, it's always been my project to write the stories of women. I think there are so many wonderful women's stories that have not been told and that can inspire us, not only epic characters like Draupadi and Palace of Illusions and Sita in Forest of Enchantments, but ordinary women, not just the queens, but ordinary women. I say ordinary in quotes because every woman is extraordinary. And every story is special and original. And I've tried to show how the individual dreams of the girls change. In the beginning, it's a lot about, you know, they're young, they're like almost teenagers, a little beyond teenage. Love, romance, uh, going to adventurous places, experiencing life, but when violence strikes their family, everything changes. And now they begin to understand what does independence really mean and what is the price we have to pay for independence? I think the, the complexity of that situation as well, that there is no singular way that they can get through things. There is always a sacrifice to be made, either on a professional or a personal level. There is always a dream that's broken. There is always a trauma that needs to be overcome, all for the betterment of the family unit. You know? Yes. And everything that you said about the family unit is also true on the national level. And I wanted through the story of these three sisters and the backdrop against which this story is uh, told, for us to remember how much sacrifice went into the creation of our nation. And you know, it is a story that the people who actually lived through it have largely passed away or are passing away. And we have to remember this story because maybe for some of us who are born into an already free India, we take it for granted. We take independence for granted. But it was, you know, a lot of people sacrificed so much to gain independence, both on the national level and the personal level. And women like uh, Priya, they fought so hard to be given the right to follow certain careers. And we take that for granted today. So I just want us to remember our history, to appreciate all the people who came before us, who allow us to live our lives with the freedoms that we so easily possess. I want to talk about secrets. Your book has a lot of, I, I actually felt that the thread of the book was secrets. There are secrets that we keep from those we love, secrets that we hold dear even, they, even though they are not secrets we own. Um, and I think the unveiling of a secret changes the way we love somebody. So can you talk about, the, I suppose, the writing of the novel and uh, this very unique thread? Yes. 
Secrets, I've always been interested in secrets. So if you've read my other books, you'll see a secret will, yeah. uh, it will have an important part to play somewhere. But here especially, secrets were important, certainly on the individual level, as you say. Each of the sisters will have a secret. And in fact, even innocent secrets in the beginning will become powerful and perhaps destructive as the novel goes along. But uh, one of the things I wanted to do in this book is to create resonance between national events and individual events, because I think they are connected. So, um, you know, on the national level too, there were many secrets. If they had been known, they would have changed the course of our history. They would have changed perhaps the way in which independence happened. For one thing, I'll just give you one. Uh, Jinnah was very sick. He, was, he had already been diagnosed with cancer. He knew he was going to die in about a year. Didn't tell anyone. If we had known this, I think things would have turned out very differently. But on the personal level, each of the sisters has a secret, and sometimes she's keeping it from the other sisters as well. It's interesting sometimes to use as collateral at some point. You know, and so also the family, the notion of the family is really interesting because there is, um, sisters of course have a complicated relationship, but in this case, um, they are sometimes fighting either for the same thing or are jealous. Well, jealousy plays a huge role as well. Um, I want to talk about the research you did for this book because um, I, I'm a historian of partition. I know what goes into recreating the landscape of that time and making it available for readers so that they feel like they can be immersed in that time. Was it a challenge? What did you refer to? Yes, you are so right, Anshul, and you know this from your own books. Uh, once we start doing research, there is this temptation to never stop doing research because there's so much out there. And also because doing research, at least for me, is easier than actually writing the book. So, but it makes you feel very virtuous when you're doing research. So sometimes I just keep doing research to put off the writing. Um, but in this case, I had a sense of urgency. I wanted this book to come out in the 75th year of our independence. So at a certain point, I said, no more research. I have to, I have to actually sit down and write. But my sources were, of course, the family stories, but also the newspapers of the time. And it was very interesting because the newspapers gave such different interpretations and even different facts. So I had to sift through a lot, that was my, depending, that was depending my on who, who publishes that yeah. newspaper. It was very different. And also at a certain point, I knew through doing later research and scholarly books about the death toll. And the newspapers of the time, for very good reasons, suppressed the death toll, largely suppressed the violence that was happening on the borders. And so I had to read through those, understand why, because they didn't want to inflame people further. They didn't want even more violence to come out of people reading or seeing those terrible photos. But I did do a lot of um, photographic research as well, which for me was very powerful because it showed you know, the dead, it showed the burnt buildings, it showed, you know, the devastated streets. Once I did that research, though, I had to step back from it and think about it from the point of view of my characters. How much of this would they have known? So I, I could only put into those, into their chapters, what they would have known and what they would have felt. Well, I think it's very interesting writing historical fiction because we are writing about moments now we know so much about. But um, I think it's so challenging to put what your characters would know at the time from a perspective of knowing more, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask, does inserting things like large historical events into fiction allow people to learn from those events more? Yes, I have always learned a great deal from the fiction I have read. You learn from nonfiction in one way, but when we read fiction and we look at those events as our characters are going through them, 
as the characters we are reading are going through them, we identify with them in a more human way. Mm. I think we feel the times. Mm. Otherwise, we know intellectually about the times. But, and of course, I'm a fiction writer, so I'm biased, but when we read their stories, when we are living their stories, because that's what we do as readers, we are living the experience of the book, then we are reliving on a very core level. I'm thinking uh, most, most people learn about partition through the early novels. You learn about loss through Kushwan Singh. You learn about the insanity of borders through Toba Take Singh. And I feel there are really true uh, lessons that can be deposited within fiction that stay with people longer. Yes. A yes, and I wanted to say one more thing, which is not so much is written about the partition that was going on in Bengal. That was my next question. Okay. <laughs> um, and actually, why do you think that is? You know, as partition scholars, I, I write about both sides of the border, but as partition scholars, we can see that there is an inequality. And as, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, the Sindh experience, the experience of Kashmir, Hyderabad, Gujarat, Northeast, Assam, Rajasthan, uh, there is very little written, Punjab dominates. So why, why do you think that is? There may not be a definitive answer to this, but in your yeah. opinion. I, I think there's no definitive answer, but perhaps, you know, some of the writers you mentioned, the really powerful writers, that was the region they were most personally um, associated with. That was the story they felt a need to tell. Just for me, as for me, I know it's a national story, uh, the story of these sisters on the Bengal border, but it's also special to me and I can write more, um, I think, from the heart because it's a personal story for me. So, and it's been written about beautifully in Bengali, but not so much in English. So I felt it was really important for us, for me to try and fill that gap and for all of you to experience what was going on in Bengal, which was really a hub of the national, nationalist movement, which played a very important part during independence. In fact, it was one of Gandhiji's favorite cities. He often came to Bengal when India was becoming independent on the 14th of August, he was not in the capital, he was in Kolkata, right? So I wanted to make sure that everyone appreciates that and knows that because if there are any Bengalis in the audience, we just love Bengali culture. Let's see some hands, yes. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about the dichotomy of um, independence versus partition. They are not the same thing. They evoke different emotions. People celebrate the joy of independence and the loss that comes with partition. And you handle this quite elegantly in the book through the lives of the sisters and the, the secondary characters associated with them. So could you talk about this dichotomy of emotion? Yes, it is a dichotomy of emotion, but I think it's really important, and in the novel I've tried to create that, uh, to understand we can't separate these two, right? The joy of independence, a true joy, a true achievement, right? We are finally free of the colonial yoke. It's a true joy, but it comes as a great price, and that's the par price of partition. So there are two prices. The price that people together fought fighting against the British they, the price that they paid, the incarcerations, the deaths, all of those, and then the more bitter price of partition where, you know, so much death, so much suffering, which looking back, I thought, and perhaps you will agree, need not have been. You know, I felt so deeply that need not have been. But I also understood something. We like to separate these emotions in our lives. We want to say, this is joy and I want this and this is loss and I don't want this. But that's not how it happens in the world. If you think about maybe important moments in your life, joy and loss were perhaps mingled in it, right? And as human beings, we need to understand that. There's no linear way to tell a story. Um, there's much in the book that can actually be considered quite contemporary, least of all the fact that there are multiple interfaith relationships or the fact that communal violence is rampant. When you were writing the book in the world that we live in today, did you feel resonance of the present day in the text? Definitely, I felt a great deal of resonance. And I think some of the resonance I felt 
is because we are forgetting our early history, right? We are forgetting how people of different faiths truly stood side by side and fought beside each other to make India happen. And, you know, it, if we forget it, if we forget those early lessons, we're just going to repeat the mistakes of those early times as well. So I felt that there was a sense, and we'll see it early in the book when the older freedom fighters are talking among themselves, and they remember how, you know, there's a, a Hindu uh, character, a main character, and very important Muslim character, and they remember how they fought side by side, how they went on the salt marches together, and um, it's just important for us to remember that people came together, they were Indians first. And it is so important, we need to be Indians first. Yes, there are differences, but we are Indians first. That is how we make our nation prosper, grow, become more beautiful. Thank you for agreeing. Would you like to read the postscript of the book? Okay. Yes, so sometimes uh, people ask me, well, why did you write this book? And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this, and I want to read the postscript. Now, the book is divided into different portions, and each portion starts with uh, a little segment that gives a national overview before we go into the sisters' lives. But at the end, there is a postscript. And the postscript, really, it came to me. I had not intended writing it. But it came to me, and it seemed so important. Um, I, I really want to share it with you because it is addressed to you, my readers. It begins very much like the first little section, but it's different. Here is a river. Here is a wind rising. Here is a village. Here is the year. The river is time, ebbing, flooding. The wind is memory. It can carry flowers. It can carry flames. The village is the world, and you are at its center. The year is now. What will you do with it? What will you do? Thank you. We can take questions, we can, and then if you have more questions. I think we can take some questions from the audience. Yeah, I thought there were going to be lots of questions. Um, actually, let's start with the, wo uh, the young woman in the pink. Hello. Ma'am, you both give us such strong female characters. It's very empowering. Angel, ma'am, just admire your uh, grandmother so much. My question is to Chitra, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, when you're writing this fiction, this uh, based around this great event, so how much in the book is coming from the author's imagination and how much is actually based on true stories? That's a great question. All the public incidents, things that actually happen in the cities, in the villages, all of those are based on research. What's going on in the people's minds, especially the three sisters as they go through challenges, those are based more on the personal stories I heard, the family stories, and also on my own imagination as I try to live the sisters' lives from inside. Um, the gentleman at the front, I'm trying to be equal in the main female ratio of questions. Myself, Govind Gurbani, I am a Sindhi. The madam uh, requested you to write on Sindhis because we came empty hands. We did not have any food to eat. My fathers, my, uh, my fathers and grandfathers. Now we are well being, but you should write on Sindhis right in, in India. Yes, and it is very important to do the research first. So if I do write on it, I will need a lot of research. Let's tell people. Um, the other thing I'd like to request is ask a question. If you have a comment or you want to speak to Chitra, you can do it after the event. Um, there's a young lady over there in the yellow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the lovely session, Anshul Ma'am and Chitra Ma'am. So, um, Chitra Ma'am, because of the books uh, that authors like yourself, like Amish Sir, has written, 
I have found myself, and not just me, a lot of people of my generation are now interested in Indian mythology. And um, ma'am, so my question is, um, can you give some advice and some tips to uh, my generation as to how do we dig deeper into Indian mythology, how do we dive deeper into our Indian history and know more and learn more about it? Thank you, great question. Well, short answer, read more of our books. <laughs> Longer, longer answer is first to understand how important that is. We are so blessed in this country, in this culture, that we have such a great uh, mythology. We have these great epics that are always new to read them, but also to think about them, to think about those characters. One of the reasons it was important for me to write Palace of Illusions and Forest of Enchantments is because I wanted uh, my readers to think about and relate to amazing women uh, heroes like Draupadi and Sita, but to understand them correctly and to understand how what we learn from them we can live in our lives today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, just uh, one more question. It's a long pending question. So I have read your um, uh, Forest of Enchantments and ma'am, you had mentioned about Ahalya's secret. Uh, Ma'am, but you never really elaborated on that and I was waiting until the end of the book for you to throw more light on Ahalya's life. Um, so Ma'am, if you could enlighten us all by telling us a little more about her life and why she observed silence. Okay, so Ahalya's life, and I'll keep it really short, everyone knows the story of Ahalya, how she is quote unquote turned to stone for something that's really not her fault, a trick that is visited upon her by the gods. Uh, what is the story? And that is also the story of Draupadi, that is also the story of Sita, that is also the story of Jamini here who undergoes uh, violence at the time of the, the big unrest around uh, independence, is that violence is done to women and then they are victim shamed. And we need to rethink that. If violence is done to a woman, if a crime is committed against a woman, why is it that society is saying it's her fault? She should be ostracized. We need to rethink the whole idea of victim shaming. Agree? Actually, on, on that note, the character of Jamni is actually incredibly complex. I wonder, um, what did you draw from to write about her? Because she's on one level a very demure, obedient, a uh, middle child. On the other hand, she has intense jealousy. She loves the same man her sister loves. That's the only spoiler I'm giving, I'm sorry. Um, but I found her to be an incredibly complicated, highly um, unlikable character. But that talks to the strength of the writing, obviously, that you are in that moment, you already have your allegiances in the novel, you know? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the character unfolded. It's it, with all of my characters, that at least the ones I'm creating as in independence, I really don't know what's going to happen to them. I discover them as I go along. And certainly that was the case with Jamini. I knew I wanted her to be unusual, but I myself didn't know how she would react. So did she surprise you? She surprised me. And I really believe in that as a writer. You know, it has been said, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. So I like my characters as they grow to surprise me and do unusual things. Thank you. Um, the young woman at the front. Hi, Hi congratulations ma'am on this brilliant book. Um, so while it's established that your women protagonists are bona fide characters, but what stands out in this book for me are the male characters, whether it's uh, Nobu Kumar or Amit or Raza. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell you that you've kind of ruined men for <laughs> women like me, because, you know, pre-independence men, I, I just wanted to ask you that um, in the book, you can see that uh, men in the pre-independence time they're in a patriarchal setup, but they're struggling with the patriarchy and conditioning within themselves. Um, what is the thought behind that? How do you how do you write such prolific male characters, ma'am? Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, as you have said, the women characters are my first love. But in this book, I really wanted to point to the men also because I wanted to uh, make it clear that something 
a great national success like independence cannot happen unless men and women come together, unless we change our preconceptions about the roles of men and women. So I'm so glad that came uh, through for you. And I have to say, uh, one of my favorite male characters, Nabu Kumar, is uh, based somewhat on my own grandfather. So I think the affection was there from my side. I really wanted to tell the story of the men as well as the women. Um, is there a, okay, let's take the young woman at the back, yeah. Yeah, 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 you. First of all, thank you for this session, really. And uh, just a very small question and maybe a little personal. And just that, um, you know, what happens is there is this concept of internalized male gaze. So it's not something that's wide. It just happens in how women behave and, you know, like how they see themselves. It's a very subtle thing. But how does it impair, impact uh, the women characters like how do they see themselves, especially you, Chitra, ma'am? Like, how do you see those women characters? Do you think there is such thing as internalized male gaze? Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. That's a great question. Yes, of course, there is internalized male gaze, um, especially if we don't think about it. It's something that, you know, society often conditions us to do because the male attitude has been so prevalent in society. But as soon as, so this is the magical thing. As soon as we become aware of such things, I think we can begin to change them for ourselves. And I think that is one of the wonderful ways in which fiction works for us, that it makes, puts us in the position of characters who are battling among other things, that internalized male gaze, the way Jamini feels after she is attacked, it's an internalized male gaze right there. But she learns what to do with it because she has become aware of it. So the first thing to changing our lives, I think, is to become aware of the beliefs that we hold, the long-term beliefs, maybe from the time we were little, maybe passed down through generations, and then decide which ones of these beliefs do I really want to keep in my life, right? So Aristotle said this a long time back, an unexamined life is not worth living. And I do hope, I pray, that some of my books have made readers examine their lives a little bit, at least. Um, I, you mentioned early on when you got up and showed us the sari about the kanta, and this question made me think about how the life of Bina is so guided by the art she does, the kanta quilt she stitches, it's also on the cover of your book. Um, and it gives her a sense of self-worth and importance when the world tells her that in fact she is a widow and life is nothing for her. Life is over for her. Do you want to talk a little bit about the art and how it gives strength to women? Yes, thank you so much for bringing that up because yes, the mother of the three uh, sisters, Bina, once her husband dies in a terrible attack during uh, direct action day, her life has changed completely. Uh, she's devastated as were many women at that time. And what allows her to heal is her art when she's able to go back into stitching the kathas for which she had been famous before, that is where she finds meaning, she finds beauty. So I really wanted to point to how art brings beauty into our lives, how art helps us heal, and that art is there for every one of us, especially that is why I wanted to use the kanta as a motif and uh, Harper Collins has done such a great job with this. Uh, I wanted to wear my kata shari to respect the women who have done this. But all of us, we can turn to art for healing. Bina is able to reclaim her personality, to reclaim, in some ways, her independence through her art. So I urge everyone, think about where the art in your life can flower and use it. Uh <laughs> We have time maybe for two more questions. Um, okay, all women. Uh, okay, the young woman with the very eager hand. Yes, you. Hi, Chitra ma'am. Congratulations on the book. Um, I just quickly want to say that um, while I loved Independence and The Last Queen, I just can't seem to forget 
the palace of illusions and forest of enchantment. So my next question is, uh, when are we getting the next mythological book? <laughs> I have been thinking about it. And uh, let's see what the future brings. Okay, so you brought up an interesting uh, question, which is, how much do I control the next book I'm going to write? And I really don't. The idea comes, and I'm blessed when the idea comes, and when a strong idea comes, it begins to like trouble my heart. It begins to kind of pound inside my chest, and that's when I know I have to write it. Until then, I could say, yes, I'll write this, and yes, I'll write that, but really that inspiration comes. So we'll have to wait and see when the inspiration comes. However, I have been thinking about the character of Radha. Would you be interested? <laughs> so maybe, if the universe wills it, maybe. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. You're standing already, why not? Good morning, ma'am. Um, so uh, all the three central characters, Deepa, Jamini, and Priya, they possess uh, very different um, feminine sensibilities, if I may say so. So uh, my question to you is, was it an intentional representation, or was it organic for you, or um, was it an inspiration from the characters that you already know? Yeah, great question. I think a lot of it was organic. I knew I wanted the sisters to be different, and especially I wanted them to want different kinds of things. So one of them wants love, one of them wants appreciation from the family and society, one of them wants a career as a doctor where she can give back to people who need it. I knew that much. But even that changes, right? Because they are um, you know, living, breathing characters, at least in my mind. So what they want will also change. I did not control that. That kind of happened on its own. I think that's really important for me as a writer to allow the character space to grow in the way they need to grow. So. I think that's one of the unpredictabilities of fiction also, that it sometimes writes like as someone now who has skirted both, I can see that the, the path is not always straight and it is, is really quite uh, unpredictable. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, this might sound strange when I'm saying it, but anyone in the audience who is creative, and especially if you write, you know the story controls the writer. The writer does not control the story. I, I just, yes. Um, the story always controls me. I just pray that I can be a good instrument for that story to come into the world. Um, the lady in the yellow at the back, yeah. Great questions, everyone. Thank you so much. Hello, ma'am. Um, so there was this QR code which you could scan with a very nice playlist. And I don't understand Bangla completely, but I really enjoyed the music. So how did that idea occur to you? I'm so glad you brought that up because again, I must thank uh, Harper Collins for the beautiful QR code that they put in into the book and you can hear all the songs that are mentioned. These songs were really important to me. My grandfather and mother would tell me about these songs. I would hear them on the radio. And these are the freedom songs that were sung during this time, songs that were banned often by the British, but that the people sang them anyway, especially as they marched, or even in the secrecy of their own homes. Music was such a big part of our independence movement. It gave us strength and courage when everything in the world seemed against us. So I wanted to honor those songs, again, from many backgrounds. Yes, Rabindranath on one side, Tagore on one side, and yes, Nazrul on the other side, coming together to create this movement of musical independence. I think also the two sisters, if you think Jamni thinks that, uh, sings the Tagore songs and later Deepa will sing Nazrul and learn Nazrul and how that is a vehicle for the division that has appeared between them as well, but also what brings them together in some way. Yes, yeah. I think you know music and art are a great way to bring people of different backgrounds together. That is certainly my hope and my prayer. Uh, oh, it's zero, zero. But um, the good news is that Chitra will be signing her book. Uh, where? 
Where? Right here. And you can speak to her and ask her questions. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, and a big thanks to Anchal for <laughs> conducting pleasure. this great interview. Unfortunately, we do not have independence from time constraints. Otherwise, we would have this session to go on and on. Um, we would like to thank Chitra Banerjee and Anshul Malhotra for this lovely session. We do thank Inox Multiplex for their support. And as Anshul said, you can find Chitra here uh, signing the books as well. We also encourage you to visit the Festival Bazaar and do follow our YouTube channel at Jaipur Lit Fest as well as our our Twitter account at Jaipur Lit Fest as well, and do tweet using the hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival. There is.